thanks, um, thanks, Peter, for this um, wonderful introduction. And it's always a pleasure to uh, come and talk here at the American Medical Society, particularly in presence of uh, great scholars who uh, I shudder to stand in front of. Um, <laughs> but um, I, um, I had given a few choices uh, of, of, of subjects for, for tonight's talk, talking to Gilles about, uh, you know, what kind of uh, subject would be appropriate, and he chose this, um, which is uh, something that I have been following uh, is in, in terms of, uh, I did my PhD on Satavahana dynasty, which was a kind of prime uh, dynasty in the, in the sub sort of southern part of the Indian subcontinent, and um, uh, a, a period of great uh, cultural uh, uh, interaction and mixture. One of the objects of this talk is also to um, be slightly interdisciplinary about it. I mean, I don't, I don't read Greek per se, but um, there has been, a, uh, in, in terms when, when you see Indian history, there has been a sort of tradition um, of people sort of sticking to their own disciplines and not talking to each other in a way. And people who work on texts go in textual directions, people who work on coins go in coin direction, people who work on art go in art historical direction. And there is a little, there's very little sort of dialogue. And one of the things that I wanted to sort of um, show here is uh, how material uh, which is uh, contained in a text uh, uh, sort of speaks to objects. So it's that's kind of, you know, um, two, two way uh, traffic in it. So for those um, who don't know um, uh, this, this particular text, Peripolis of the Eritrean Sea. It's a, it's a Greek uh, 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 text which is anonymous. We don't know who wrote it. Most likely uh, the person who wrote it was uh, a Hellenistic, Hellenized Egyptian. And um, now, after a lot of uh, discussion over its date, now we have sort of settled to date it to about mid first century AD. Of sort of, of, um, um, and um, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a lonely planet like thing. It's not exactly, you know, it talks about, you know, you got to go, you go into India, then, you know, you go here, you do this, you don't go there, it's a bit dangerous. And it's kind of that sort of information in it, you know. And um, uh, it describes these kind of routes and commodities of trade between Egypt to India and East Africa. So it covers a wide geographical uh, remit in terms of its, uh, its, its scope. Um, it's been known for a long time. There is a there is a, a, a parchment sort of handwritten uh, text that ex exists in Heidelberg that's been dated about 11th century or something like that. But it for first uh, first appeared in print in 1533, and uh, it was in 20th century first. Uh, it was critically uh, sort of edited by Schoff, and then in 1989 the most famous edition is by Lionel Casson, uh, who sort of you know uh, put it in with, with annotations and everything quite nicely. Um, its historical utility in 20th century, there was a kind of a um, uh, interest, a refound interest in uh, tracking the connections between the East and the West and how, how, how trade became one of the kind of avenues or vehicles for um, doing these, uh, studying these interactions. And scholars like uh, Warmington <coughs> were early um, um, expon exponents of, of, of this text. Casson, of course, has written considerably about it, apart from editing it in, in, a, in a sort of textual historical sense. Joe Cribb has uh, talked about what a part of it is about um, how coins have helped in dating the text. Uh, and quite recently, historians like Federico de Romanis have been talking a great deal about uh, this whole period and how um, various components of, of, uh, of, uh, of this trade was, uh, was significant for. There are lots of Indian scholars that, again, the same sort of um, chronological spectrum. Rai Chaudhary was a very early uh, person who dealt with history of trade. P. L. Gupta, uh, the, the doyen of Indian numismatics, talked, talk, of course, he, he touched everything like the great sage Vyasa. And, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, one, one of his uh, things was, uh, he talked about this as well. And uh, Shobhana Gokhale, who was in Deccan College, a numismatist in, uh, in Pune, she uh, sort of discussed this as well. Primarily, this tells, uh, you know, uh, sort of it's a kind of primary account for um, knowing maritime histories. It's, you know, that's, that's where its focus lies. But also, uh, it has glossings about political history, for particularly as we shall see, particularly when it 
when it talks about you know there is this thing happening here oh th th this particular place is dangerous because there is there are wars going on or something like that so there is a kind of impression of what was going on politically as well um it also talks uh, considerably about uh, about geopolitics of the region. It, it talks about certain ports being more susceptible for this, these kind of political uh, uh, shenanigans that were going on between various dynasties. And um, uh, of course, the main focus of the, of the text is trade and commerce. That's, that's, his, that's what it talks about. But secondarily, it, it, has, it can be deployed in the study of uh, Indian art, uh, in numismatics, and of course, quite considerably, uh, quite interestingly, the ancient Indian chronology at that particular time. Um, so the world that this text uh, straddles, this is a very famous map that I plucked from the internet, and uh, it's, uh, it, it, it shows you all the places that it mentions uh, and sort of routes that it mentions across. Uh, so you can see that it, it, the, the, the area is, is quite, uh, astonishingly large. That's the Red Sea, that's the kind of uh, the Arabian Sea and the to access to India. In red color here are the names of kings that he mentions. So there are, you know, there are these kind of um, um, articles of merchandise that are being that are being sort of listed in this sort of uh, uh, that sort of color. But it, it has lots and lots and lots of information uh, in, in, in a few, not, not so many pages. So it's a kind of very dense and condensed text. Um, um, there are kind of markers within the text that you can date it, um, that can use, you can use to date it. Um, from the West, if you sort of approach it uh, from the Western kind of perspective, there is uh, a king called Malicus, uh, who is mentioned as the king of the Nabataeans. And he is, his date is particularly uh, important because it, it's 40 to 70 AD, and that's the first kind of glimpse that we get within the text of what sort of period we are looking at. From the east, we have this particular king called Nambanus or Manbanos, and we shall see uh, in a little while who he was. And um, it has sort of presented itself as a chronological anchor for a whole lot of information. So we have peoples, and th these are all the peoples that are mentioned in this Nabataeans, Homerites, Sibians, Parthians, Bactrians, Paradai, Aratrioi, Gandharioi, Kiradai, Bragisoi, whatever. Um, similar impressive list of kings that appear in it, Caribel, Eliazos, Manbanos, Sarganus the Elder, this is uh, a curious character which we, sh we shall see a little bit more about, Sandanis, uh, and of course the kingdom of Pandyas down in the south of India, it's called Pandion. Um, then, as I said, there are these kind of events uh, that it sort of refers to in, in passing. So when he talks about Parthians, um, uh, he mentions that, oh, they're chasing each other for the throne. So there's this kind of um, tussle politically going on between the Parthians that he sort of makes a reference to. The Bactrians, whoever they were, are called warlike, and they're sort of constantly fighting against each other as well. And um, then he sort of makes these kind of um, political statements like most of the people do nowadays, you know, sort of all was well under Elder Sarganus, but, you know, but not under Sandanus. So Sandanus is, the situation has changed under Sandanus. So these kind of, you know, little sort of snippets of information. Um, it's, um, so, so, so these are the kind of bones that we can add flesh on by contextualizing this information with different uh, sort of materials. And one of those materials is, of course, coins. And that's what we are uh, concerned with mainly. Um, there are, of course, coins being talked about in the text itself. That's, that's another thing that, that is important about text. So he talks about um, denarian, which is a kind of a numismatic term for, obviously, for the Roman denarius denarii uh, that were being used. What is quite interesting is that he uh, mentions um, the kind of information that you get about uh, his mentions is um, money is being used in different registers. So there are certain societies which use money more than certain other societies. Certain societies don't use it at all. So when he's talking about, uh, say, the East African coast, he says, you don't require a lot of money there because money is used only by resident foreigners. So that's what he says. And uh, so when you're going on the African coast like Adulis or Malau or Oponi, 
you don't use you don't require a lot of money to money with you because money is only uh, for used by by these resident foreigners whoever they were um, but if you go at Khania, which is uh, south of Yemen uh, then he says that money is mentioned amongst gifts to be given to the king so obviously the king whoever is there is valuing uh, the role of money as, as, as a gift kind of thing and when it comes to India there is the, it looks like the monetary picture here is far more advanced and he says that um, um, you should carry definitely silver and gold denarions uh, in when you sort of uh, move to Barigaza which is the port of Baruch or Barukacha on the western Indian coast because it commands profit over local currency so that's his very clear statement um, so when you go south uh, to the ports of Muziris and Nelkinda which were on the Kerala coast uh, deep south of India there you say he says that there is so much merchandise available that you require a lot of money to buy it so you should definitely have money if you're going there and you make sure that you carry a lot of it because there is lots of material lots of stuff to buy there so um, and then he sort of makes also mentions about um, um, what sort of money was being current there so not just money that you carry with you but also what do you see in circulation so he makes this kind of oblique represent, uh, uh, reference to old drachmas engraved with inscriptions mentioning Apollodotos and Menander encountered on in the market in Barigaza so there is there is you know he's going to the market and there are these old these are these are actually Indo-Greek coins and he very clearly says that they were uh, circulating in the market in Barigaza so there is a you know a not just um, uh, money used but also the kind of money that was being used and he makes some very clear mentions about it the question uh, you know um, about who these kings were uh, numismatics is a subject that keeps on throwing more and more interesting evidences all the time you know uh, it's a kind of ever-evolving discipline and uh, sometimes you know the coins of the Western Shatrap King Nahapana were known for a long time and his identity or possible identity with Manbanos or Nambanus that the Periplus mentions had been proposed even before we actually found a clear numismatic proof of it or a clear numismatic indication of it and uh, amongst uh, all the uh, uh, coins of Nahapana uh, you can see that um, this, partic oops, uh, this particular coin has this inscription here and on most of the coins the inscription is actually a Greek transliteration of the Prakrit legend so this Indian legend has been just been sort of transcribed into Greece but on some rare issues that there is actually uh, instead of saying the king Shaharata or Kshatrapa Nahapana it uses words like Basilios so it's very clearly a Greek kind of uh, rendering it's not just a transcription of the Indian uh, Indian inscription so you can see here that that starts on B this is as Basilios is quite clear and here it says N A B A N O U so Nabanu is a kind of rendering of Nahapana Indu and this is exactly the form uh, that, uh, um, that that the Periplus actually uses that that little uh, nasalization numbanus that happens is actually a, a, a Indian pronunciation trait it's a kind of vocalizing a, 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 cons a, a nasal sound which is not there so instead of saying Nahapana they say Nappana uh, it sort of becomes with there's a bit of a nasalized, nasalized consonant appears in it and that's what the numbanus the word numbanus is catching mm. um, so numismatically we found a clear evidence of that that particular Nahapana was actually uh, Nambanus was actually in Hapana and um, he, uh, he, he has a vivid description of uh, this, this thing called the uh, country of Ariaka that's what he calls Gujarat which is on the western coast of India and he says beyond the Bel Gulf of Baraka which is now present town of Dwaraka which is on the tip of uh, the Gujarat Peninsula uh, the kingdom is of Barigaza which is Barukacha uh, and the coast of the country of Ariaka which is the beginning of the kingdom of Nambanus and all of India of that this is where India begins if you are approaching from the western seaboard um, the, the, the um, country of Barigaza and the Gulf of Baraka is where India begins that's what his, his, his thing is 
And um, the coast is called Surastrim, which is a kind of, again, a Greek version of the word Saurashtra, which is even now it's used uh, for, for denoting that particular land mass. And um, I said this is newly discovered, but it's not exactly new anymore. It's, it's, it's been about 10 years ago. Now, so <laughs> and uh, now uh, things, as I said, things have moved on. And currently we have uh, on hands a very impressive book by Alex Fishman, uh, which who, who uh, gives a very impressive treatment of um, Western Shatrap coins. And he actually has more information on the inscriptions, the legends, uh, than what I have just sort of encapsulated in a single slide here. So that that whole articulation of the inscription is is uh, a, a, a subject in itself about how uh, these coins are then sort of classified. Um, what's um, significant about uh, the coins of Nahapana? So once we establish that uh, Nambanus is actually Nahapana. Uh, we we have a, a important chronological marker, and then coins have again helped in dating this this whole episode anyway because we have coins which are counterstruck. Now this is a particular numismatic methodology. The numismatist amongst the audience would know it very well that coins are sometimes counterstamped by different authorities using the same denomination standard. So if the denomination standard used by two polities is same, sometimes the polity wi polities will use each other's coins as, as substrates to make their own coins. That is economically uh, a more attractive proposition because it uh, sort of omits certain step in, s in, the, in the manufacture of coins. So we have these excellent uh, 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 counter strikes. So um, the first coin up there is actually a coin of Nahapana counter struck over Sasis the Indo-Parthian king in Sin. So there's, there's this particular Indo-Parthian king. I won't go into details of that because that will mean another talk uh, at, at, at an extent. So, but he's sort of dated to about 20 to 46 AD and his coins have been used by Nhapana to stamp his coins on. And what is fascinating or interesting is that um, you can see that that arrow, that yellow arrow that just came up actually shows remnants of the coins of Sasis, which are visible through um, the, the kind of temple, the ear part of Nahapana's bust there. And for that, you have to take my word because, uh, as I said, if I start explaining everything in great detail, it will be another uh, half, 20 minutes or half an hour. What is absolutely interesting is that it is not a one-way uh, street in counter-striking. Uh, there, on that arrow, you can see that little line that's actually the back of the bust of Nahapana. Mm -hmm. So it is not just um, Nahapana counter-striking Sasis, it's Sasis counter-striking Nahapana as well. Mm -hmm. And this particular phenomenon can happen only when the two kings are contemporary. Mm -hmm. So that sort of nails uh, uh, the date very, very precisely into this kind of you know, mid first century AD period. And it was not only uh, Sasis that struck uh, coins of uh, Nahapana. It there was uh, uh, Satavastris, who was uh, one of the s uh, successors of Sasis. His coins were also uh, uh, counterstruck by Nahapana. And there you can see that this little, these, these little three things are actually remnants of Karoshti inscription from the coins of Satavastris. And there you can see the ghost of Nahapana's bust which is sort of peeping out uh, with sort of, you know, uh, from, from, the, from, the, from the backdrop. So um, Sasis and Satavastris are uh, actually linked with Nahapana in what I called as an isochronism. I like uh, neologisms quite a lot. So, <laughs> um, so this is the, the, that means that they sort of, you know, exist contemporarily. So we get this lovely, neat numismatic evidence for the date of Nahapana, Sasis, and inter alia of the Periplus as well. So um, um, the kind of coins that, uh, Napa, uh, that uh, the Periplus uh, talks about, just a kind of examples, a few slides of these are the coins that were sort of contemporary. And these are the coins that the, the people who were actually um, reading Periplus in first century AD might have come across. So 
that is a standard uh, coin of Nahapana again. Here you can see that the inscription here is not Basilios Nambanu, but it's uh, the transliteration or transcription of uh, the Prakrit legend. Um, these are early Satavahana coins. Uh, the Satavahanas were the first indigenous dynasty to start their own portrait coins. Uh, so that's the, uh, the portrait of uh, King Vasishtiputra Sri Satakarni, uh, Sri Pulomavi. That, that uh, label is wrong, sorry. Um, and uh, um, they sort of are almost comparable in their denomination and exchange values. They are both about 2.3 grams in silver and there is a kind of, you know, one feeds into uh, the kind of one sort of acts as an inspiration to the, to the second one. Then, of course, there are denarions, as we see, uh, and these are the two most common denarions in the first century AD. Uh, the, the issues of uh, Augustus and Tiberius, that's the famous, uh, what is called as tribute penny, uh, which was sort of early first century AD. And then uh, uh, the, there are umpteen numbers of uh, these coins uh, have been found in India. So, you know, that's the kind of, uh, and um, 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 people have actually done some interesting quantifications of Roman coins found in India and these these two the reigns of these two emperors come trumps at the at the top at the at the most uh, numerous uh, in, in, in this coins from the the the, the sort of uh, southern peninsula of Arabia region that's uh, the coin of uh, Malikus the second the Nabatean king that he mentions and also uh, coins of Himyarites and who were the lords of Himyar um, and that's what the inscription sort of reads them as uh, is the Lord of Lords of Himyar and Saba and that actually is in Sabian uh, script. So these are the coins uh, of co contemporary to the date of uh, some more. Um, that's again uh, 50 to 150 AD Himyarite coin and I'm showing that particular coin sp specifically because again that those coins are actually found in India in, in two or three hordes that have been reported. Uh, in, in the literature. Uh, that is a small dram of uh, uh, Persis uh, imitation, which is from the Northern uh, Arabian Peninsula. The Kingdom of Persis was a subsidiary kingdom of, of the Parthians and was ruling on the southern coast of Iran. And of course, that was um, sort of speaking, as it were, in trade terms with the northern coast of the Arabian Peninsula. And these coins were then imitated on, at sites on the northern coast of, uh, of, of Arabia. Then we come to these kind of specific questions and where, where um, uh, the, 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 the question was this, uh, who was this elder Sarganus? So in chapter, uh, uh, sort of not chapter, uh, paragraph 52 of the text, it, it gives you this interesting sort of snippet of information saying that the market towns of this region are in order after Barigaza, Supara, and then the city of Kaliena, which in the time of the elder Sarganus become a lawful market town. But since it became came into the possession of Sandaris, the port is much obstructed and the Greek ships landing there may chance to be taken to Barigaza under guard. So there is, this is a kind of insight into the political situation which is not really very right here. Uh, there was this elder Sarganus, whoever he was, and then he's a, his, his, under, his situ under his reign, the situation was all right. But then he's succeeded by this guy, chap called Sandaris or Sandanes. And at his, in, under his tenure, the situation is not right or right uh, in politically. And if you actually try to approach these, uh, the ships might be taken sort of un, in, under guard to another port. So that's, that's what the thing is saying. Um, who were these, these characters uh, was, a, was a naughty question which people tried to engage with for a long time. But again, coins provide us with, with, with an answer. And, um, we talked about counter-striking, and this is uh, a coin of Nahapana uh, counter-struck with a Brahmi inscription, which reads, reads Shi Siva Satakani. So this was a particular Satavahana king called Shiva Satakarani. And we know that he was contemporary to Nahapana, at least in the earlier reigns of Nahapana, because again, like Sasis, his coins are counter-struck both ways. There is Shiva Satakarani counter-striking Nahapana's coins and Nahapana counter-strikes Shiva Satakarani's coins. So they could actually exist only as, as contemporaries. Who was Shiva Satakarani? Now it's very quite was evident that the word Sarganus is a kind of Greek version of the Prakrit word Satakarani. 
But why was he called elder was the question that we, didn't, we, we were sort of grappling with. This evidence suggests that uh, there were two Satakarnis at this time. Both had the same metronymic. These, these kings were, were matrilineal, sort of, they, had, they, they described their, uh, their name with a metronymic beginning at, at, at the name. So both these kings, Shiva Satakarni and his younger brother Satakarni, were sons of Gautami. So it was called Gautami Putra Shiva Satakarni. And this elder Sarganas actually makes a distinction between these two. So Gautami Putra Shiva Satakarni was the older chap and Gautami Putra Shri Satakarni or Gautami Putra Satakarni was the younger chap. So these, this is what we know um, uh, we, could, we could actually identify from, from coins. And um, so, so Gautami Putra Shiva Satakarni emerges as uh, an early contemporary of uh, Nahapana. And as I said, he was elder brother of Gautami Putra Siri Satakarni, who subsequently in this war that was being mentioned went on and defeated Nahapana and exterminated him. And, and that particular extermination <coughs> is mentioned in one of his inscriptions very clearly. Um, so coins again sort of help us uh, to contextualize these developments in, uh, mentioned in the Periplus uh, quite, quite, uh, quite distinctly. Shown above are two other types of coins of Shiva Satkarni. So these are uh, coins of a lion type and here his name is again written in Brahmi script. This is a coin of a hill type and uh, the, the name is mentioned again in Brahmi on, on above. This is just to show that Nahapana was contemporary with two Satvahana kings, not just one. Uh, and this is again known from uh, counter-striking, the evidence of uh, counter-striking of coins. And this is what uh, this is what the political rivalry that that uh, uh, Periplus talks about was. Um, the fighting uh, kingdoms were the Western Shatra House of Shaharatas, which was in Gujarat, and the House of Satvahanas, which was in the Deccan. What they were fighting against basically was the profits of the Roman trade. The, the, the trade that was landing on the western coast of India in first, of first century AD was so influential and so important for these that they actually vied to get things out of, you know, who, who controlled uh, these trades. So again, this is, oops. Think about it. Um, uh, this is Nahapana counter-striking a Satvahana copper coin. That is, what you can see here are the lower part of an elephant, his four legs. And on the elephant are struck a thunderbolt and an arrow, which was uh, the dynastic emblem of Nahapana. This is a coin, silver coin of Nahapana, which has been overstruck by the Satavahanas. And again, you can see that this, this is the bust of Nahapana, kind of upside down here. But on top of it, the Satavahanas have stamped this hill. And on the reverse, there is the bit of thunderbolt and arrow that you can see, but on top of that, there is this kind of four orbed symbol, which was a dynastic emblem of the Satvahanas. So very clearly the Satvahanas and, and, uh, uh, and the Western Shatras have been fighting a numismatic war as well in, in, um, amongst themselves. Um, so much so for uh, coins, but there are uh, certain commodities that are mentioned in, in Periplus, which might have a bearing on coinage in a sort of indirect uh, sense as well. So of course, one of the commodities that the, that the Periplus mentions is metals. There's copper, there's tin, lead, and it is imported. And in all these kind of Western seaboard towns of India, like Barigaza, Muziris, and Nelkinda, they're all entrepôts for the import of these, these, these metals. And uh, there is, of course, gold and silver. But it sort of appears both ways. It talks about denarions as so whether the metals were imported as bullion or only as coins, we have not much idea. Uh, it could mean both and it could sort of, you know, mean in, in both um, uh, for both, uh, both the things. There is, um, there are these kind of interesting chemicals uh, which are called realgar and orpiment and uh, they are actually sulfides of arsenic. And traditionally, uh, they have been thought to be used in cosmetics. And they were sort of making, you know, coal and things that people were using on, uh, on their skins to lighten or darken their eyes, like eye shadows and coal. And, um, but 
there is uh, evidence, metallurgical evidence available to suggest that local coins of India at this time were actually are made of an arsenical alloy. And that is because uh, when you add arsenic to copper, the malleability of copper increases. And copper is a very difficult metal to work with. Copper has a very high melting point. So it's, it's, it's a very labor intensive um, uh, process to actually strike coins of copper. So many uh, uh, cultures and societies across the world have used additives to make copper more workable in any way. So one of the ways uh, uh, w uh, to make the copper more workable was to add arsenic onto it. And so for example, these are uh, the coins that were struck. You, these are made of arsenical alloy. And of course, the Satvahana currency was used lead in large quantities as well. So was perhaps some of these lead, this lead was coming for imported or not, we don't know because lead usually comes as, um, uh, is mined as an alloy, as a kind of um, ore for silver. And there, 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 is, there is not much of a production of silver ore in India. So the lead that was being used uh, elsewhere was kind of produced as a secondary product of m refining silver had to be exported somewhere and had to be used. And perhaps uh, uh, the lead that was coming into India was actually uh, uh, made to uh, use some of these, uh, some of these coins. Just so just mm -hmm. explain why arsenic is used with lead. Arsenic is not used with lead. Arsenic is only used with copper. The top coin is, is with arsenic. The bottom coin is only with lead. But lead is mentioned as a commodity that is imported into India. So some of the lead might have been used in coins. That was um, what I'm sort of hinting at. Much like some of the arsenic, which is actually being used, of course, to make cosmetics, but also uh, some of the things that are, because that, that particular coin is, is actually made of, uh, of an arsenical alloy of copper, tin, and lead. And these, all these additives are added to copper to make it more user-friendly, as it were. So, um, so um, there are these kind of mentions that so uh, when we saw that he mentions coins with the with the with the names of Apollodotos and Menander uh, were encountered in markets in on the western coast and of course we have um, uh, actual hoard evidence coming from Gujarat to that corroborates this information very well. I mean there was one hoard that was found in a po in a in a in a place called Goga, which is actually a, a port on the Gulf of Cambay on the eastern seaboard of Gujarat Peninsula. And it's sort of, it's kind of opposite the port of uh, Barigaza Bar in a way, in a sort of ge ge geographical, ge geographical sense. And the hoard was found there uh, in 1980s and dispersed on the market, but it was published by John D. L. in 1984. And it contained together coins of Apollodotos and Nahapana. A similar hoard has been has turned up in 2010 and 2011. Unfortunately, uh, the sad situation is that when hoards appear in India, there is not um, there is no uh, official um, net to catch them. So they are found and they, are, they sort of appear, you know, dispersed on the market. And this hoard that appeared in 2000, uh, 2010 and 2011 around that time is an enormous hoard. I would I would dare to say that there were 50,000 coins in it. And it's a really massive hoard. And um, the composition of that is Nahapana, Apollodotos II, but also, quite interestingly, the sort of kings that subsequently came after Apollodotos II, which were uh, Dionysios and Zoilos II. Even those coins were found in that. They were not present in the first Goga hoard, at least to, to, to what the, the sample that uh, John Dale uh, retrieved did not have them. But uh, the second hoard definitely uh, uh, had, had these coins. It's a massive coin. So these hoards are a kind of direct testimony to what uh, uh, the, in the information in, in, in Periplus says about the actual circulation of coins. Like coins that were coming into India, the trade, of course, is a kind of you know, bi bilateral kind of activity. There are lots of coins from Indian subcontinent instances, not, not massive, like no, not 50,000, but there are instances of uh, Indian coins which are sort of reported across on the other side as, uh, of, of, of the Arabian Sea as well. And um, so uninscribed die struck coins from, oops, from Gujarat 
um, uh, were reported uh, in Miliha and Ed Dur, uh, published by Dan Potts, who's not here, unfortunately. Uh, um, but recently, an Italian archaeologist sent me a picture of a similar coin that they dug up in uh, a place called Inkitat, which is in Oman. So this is kind of you know across the board. Uh, there are, of course, Western Shatrap coins in Maliha as well, and also in Berenike, very famously. Um, there is a Satavahana coin found in Berenike, which Steve Sidebottom has shown me. So, and it's, 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 it's been published in, in one of his reports. Um, quite recently, uh, the French uh, uh, archaeological team digging in uh, Abu Quraya in Egypt uh, found a Chera coin, uh, which we sort of jointly published in the Red Sea Conference in Lyon. Uh, which eventually I believe it will come up as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, uh, publishing somehow, uh, maybe in a couple of years. Um, there have been Kushan coins uh, documented from Iraq and Ethiopia. Then there are Aksumite coins found in India, which is Mangalore. Himerite coin finds in, in India, which is South Gujarat. This hoard was reported a long time ago, I think in 1898, the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society of Bengal reports this hoard um, in, in from South Gujarat. And of course, the story of Roman coins is everywhere. I mean, there, are, there are tons and tons of <laughs> Roman coins found in India or constantly. Um, again, unfortunately, s uh, what appears as hoards and ends up in museums is only a very small fraction of what actually is found as single finds in, in riverbed uh, scavenging activities of people in, 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 in riverbeds, etc. Um, um, I Currently, uh, I have found a, a kind of, you know, because people, people send me information uh, from across the Indian trade, and I don't know what to do with it because I, you know, I, I can't just keep on saving everything uh, on my computer because it's too much of it. So currently, there is uh, the Coin Hordes of the Roman Empire project uh, that is being run in, in Oxford, uh, and one of the persons uh, has agreed to sort of whatever I receive on WhatsApp and other things, I just pass it on to him, and there's a kind of a uh, a vague find spot information given about them. So at least we have some documentation being done. It's not completely lost. And every two or three months, there are four coins, two coins, three coins sort of coming up in mainly in Maharashtra, mainly in Gujarat, in Madhya Pradesh, all these parts of India. Karnataka is another sort of hotbed where these kind of stray finds are, are, are reported. So. Um, of course, one of the things that uh, uh, the Roman coins uh, give rise to is that they actually also circulate themselves as money in India. And uh, they acquire very interesting characteristics. So for example, this particular Roman coin that was found in India has this characteristic chisel mark. And people have uh, uh, proposed lots of theories uh, and fantasies about why these uh, chisel marks were applied. But the simple functional practical answer to that is that they were applied to actually decide whether this 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 coin is uh, of purely of gold or not and the chisel marks usually appear on the highest point of relief on coins which is the temple of the emperor which is again it's it's a strike it's a characteristic of the coin strike and um, that's where we have these chisel marks um, coins like the famous uh, lugdunum uh, denarius is kind of then imitated in india this is a clear uh, very clearly an Indian imitation which you know, has this kind of things being sort of jumbled here. Some of them are, are clear, some of them are not. This is a phenomenon that is uh, attracting attention only very recently. Um, uh, Jeremy, who's in, in the audience, has done some very in interesting work on it. There is also a girl called Emilia uh, in, uh, in Emilia Smagur in Warsaw in Poland. She's now looking at this from a viewpoint of, uh, you know, what kind of social lives these objects had when they reached India. It's not so much. Numismatists have traditionally regarded them as not worth studying because they are barbarous and imitations. So they don't, they don't fit anywhere. And numismatists like attributable coins. So uh, if, they, if you can't really attribute them, if, you, if it doesn't fit into a particular framework of typology, then you know people sort of start losing interest. But having said that, from a circulatory history point of view, these are absolutely stunning objects, and you know they 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 they, they not only uh, uh, sort of spur these imitations on, but they actually get consumed in different sort of artifacts. So, for example, um, oops, oh, beg your pardon, sorry. Um, there was there was a slide that has gone missing, but there was a slide that that showed uh, uh, a a kind of signet ring, 
which had pictures of Roman, the Roman Empire, Emperor Septimus Severus and his wife uh, and with a Brahmi inscription underneath it. It's an absolutely fabulous object, clear uh, indications. But also the actual um, vehicles of trade were also being shown in these coins. So ships become a motif of coin design in this period. There's not, there are no ship, ship type coins. And um, that is a Satavahana coin with a, with a ship on. You got to have a slight you know, vivid imagination to see the ship here. Uh, but there's two masts and riggings. And what is also very interesting is that it has, um, uh, it's not very clear on this particular specimen, but on other specimens, it shows an outrigger, which means it was a hopping ship. It was not a transoceanic ship. It was not something that was going across the oceans, but it was actually going uh, alongside the coast in sort of hopping trips uh, to keep it stable. Uh, similarly, this is a, a very uh, interesting uh, example of the famous Ostia Harbor Cestertius of Rome, uh, the Roman Emperor Nero. Uh, when you see lots of uh, uh, little ships uh, size here. And um, when I was young, I sort of amused uh, somebody and uh, saying that, well, one of these ships really looks like that ship. And it, you know, it's not like, it's not like that Satavahana ships were reaching all the way to Rome, but you know, there's a kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, similarity, even though it is, it is facile. It's, a, it's a, an interesting thing to say. Uh, this map shows uh, all the places that were kind of mentioned in the, the, the Periplus. So what was this trade doing? What, why, why, what was this wealth in terms of coins, you know, metals, commodities that was landing in India? What was, what was it spurring to? What was, what was it producing? So you can see that the topography of the country is quite interesting. So there's a very narrow strip of land with all these little harbors on the, on the seaside. Then there is a huge mountain chain and there are passes from these mountains. The trade can access all the emporia which are located on the plateau here only through if it passes through these these little passes uh, um, uh, on, on, on the on the mountain chain along these passes the basalt rock gave a very important medium of establishment of uh, religious institutions or establishments like monasteries and these monasteries were actually rock cut in rock and they were hewn in rock very similar things happen in Gandhara where the proceeds of the, the richness uh, that, that the trade derives is again used in structural Buddhist uh, uh, monuments. But here, of course, uh, it, it, it sort of gets consumed into building uh, and financing these, these rock cut monuments. And it's a fabulous uh, uh, site. This is the cave at Bhaja, which is one of the earliest caves in, in the Deccan, um, uh, dated to about first century BC. Um, and uh, in these uh, caves, there are these kind of massive, uh, beautiful pillared halls. This is all uh, hewn out of rock. You know, the rock's been cleared, and this is this this Buddhist stupa has been created. This is at uh, a place called Karla in in the Deccan, and um, that umbrella on the top of the of the stupa is actually dated to first century A.D., second century A.D. So the wood is has been dated uh, to second century A.D. So it's actual, uh, you know, it's the real McCoy there. It's not it's not a, it's not a replacement. Very little of this date of an organic nature survives in India, but this is a very very significant uh, aspect. But on the these pillars, you find uh, inscriptions. You can see that there's a little inscription there, and a lot of these inscriptions are actually written by these tribes called the Yavanas. Now, Yavanas is uh, the Sanskritized reference to what people uh, regard as Romans, quote unquote. I mean, this is a very contentious uh, thing about where they say, well, but we, I mean, we use the term Romans or Greeks in a very sort of, you know, umbrella terms. We really don't know what real ethnicity of, of these Yavanas was, but it has the roots in the word Ionian. That's where it comes from. and. I must confess that uh, the Indians were not exactly uh, the, a single sort of entity to refer to the Greeks in general as Ionians. There were other uh, com communities, particularly in, Ira in Iran and Iraq, who also have referred to the Greeks as Ionians or, or with sort of cognates in, in their own language. And most of these Yavanas, who were they were uh, Greeks or Roman traders, uh, have um, a kind of appellation that suggests that they were fully Indianized in a way because they have Indian names. And interestingly, the name that precedes their uh, ethnic uh, marker Yavana is usually a genitive plural. 
so they are represent they are sort of rep um saying that i am an ionian of a group of people and that group of people has an indian name and this was a uh, a way of actually showing your surnames in india at that time because we have other examples if you study the onomastic of uh, these pe the inscriptions at, at, at this time you find that this this kind of use of genitive plural um, compounds was indication that they came from uh, a particular group so it was kind of identity of a clan and they they functioned as surnames that's what it is so these are greeks which call themselves identify themselves as yavanas but have kind of indian surnames attached to them so very uh, fascinating uh, example uh, that that happens uh, with this uh you have representations of uh, these people as well that's a very famous uh, uh, medallion from the great stupa at amaravati in andhra pradesh which is now rest in 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 uh, the government museum at chennai in south india and uh, there is that's the kind of king that is been seated here but at the base you can see that that this group of people wearing tunics and uh they are bringing gifts to him there there's this there's this and these are the kind of uh, the ways that the rest of the population is indian and this guy here again with a with a straight sword and wearing a tunic with sort of curly hair and he's bringing sort of he's he's bringing this horse into the assembly so there's a clear indication of people who are foreign which have been other due to with their with reference to their hairstyles with their with their dresses that are shown as 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 foreigners in 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 these kind of representations um the kind of uh, interaction that they spurred also meant that motives artistic motives from uh, the eastern mediterranean world were also imported into this that is a coin struck in on the western coast with a hippocampus on it and there's no absolutely no uh, uh, context for a hippocampus in india at this time apart from the hippocampi or hippocampuses that were coming as as visual motifs uh, borrowed from the eastern mediterranean and not only on coins but the person the dynasty that issued this coin has left a few inscriptions and you can see that at the beginning of the inscription as an auspicious symbol also there is a representation of a hippocampus so these motives uh, sort of uh, you know have acquire different sort of vocabularies and they they mean uh, different things uh, in 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 different uh, societal uh, contexts um coin wise that's a coin of a satavahana king shri satakarni gautami putra shri satakarni and elephant but in front of an elephant there is a kind of elongated vase which some people have suggested that it's an amphora it doesn't have the ears but it still has the kind of torpedo like uh, shape uh, uh, that 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 um, is and again vase is uh, con considered a symbol of plenty in indian culture and showing that symbol of plenty with a with a roman influence actually is actually suggesting that the wealth lies in the trade that was that was coming into into the things ah th th this is the one <laughs> this is the one i was looking for and uh, that's the picture of uh, uh, septimus severus and his wife and there is a, a a brahmi inscription at the bottom and of course coins that were consumed in in jewelry uh ignore this vr please this is this is this is a graffito left <laughs> later on the victorian times but that's a kind of indian imitation of a roman coin which has been pierced and then looped and used in different ways and consumed in jewelry so um anthropologically uh these these imitations are absolutely fabulous uh you have representations of uh, other sort of western or eastern mediterranean uh, motives in rock art in india these are the tops of the pillar that we saw that colonnade in the uh, earlier slide and uh, one of the top of the pillars has these little figures of sphinxes on them so there is there is a, a lion with a human face on two of these uh, with this kind of flaps that were that are coming from his ears down much like an egyptian sphinx would have a, uh, have the flaps so um these kind of motives uh, get get across to india as well and of course the classic example the two objects that completely epitomize or encapsulate the the trade in luxury goods between india and west is this um um oops 
um, um, Poseidon uh, that was found in Kolhapur in, uh, in an excavation at a place called Brahmapuri in the Deccan and the famous uh, ivory figurine of uh, Indian origins which was found in Pompeii uh, around the same, you know, dated up to about late, late first century AD. Uh, classic examples of uh, trade that was, that was going on between the, the two uh, figurines. So to conclude, uh, I would say uh, the lecture, as I said at the beginning, uh, says, gives us a kind of an interaction between coins and texts and texts and objects really, uh, between and the periplus and coins uh, neatly encapsulate how we can contextualize these two um, uh, sources of evidence at our disposal in a kind of interesting ways. There are uh, there is a lot of new and comparative or corroborative evidence uh, providing context for both. So you, you through coins you can you can throw a light on the text and through the text you can learn more about coins. So it's kind of you know mutual in a way. The details are textual and numis numismatic in you know sort of deep reading of both <coughs> these things provides this kind of brings out these uh, these contexts. Uh, the greater historical utility. Uh, lies in what I call as isochronisms, these kind of contemporary nesses of various uh, entities. And um, so you have the, 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 the contemporary ness mentioned in the textual framework, and then you have them from the numismatic methods, such as counter-striking, uh, sort of speaking uh, to these isochronisms. So um, from, not to mention all the trade and everything that I showed you, uh, you can say that uh, you can see that how uh, adding more and more context uh, to the numismatic material uh, makes this a very fascinating subject. Thank you.